can be no doubt that something horrible happened. While there are lots of natural wonders around the Earth, there's nothing quite like the Grand Canyon. This is the type of place that you can't just describe. It's something you have to experience firsthand to truly understand its magnificence. From its unbelievable size to every little twist and turn throughout the whole 277 miles, this is truly a place like no other, which is also why it's so popular. Almost six million people visit the site every year, but all of that is about to change. Something terrifying is happening in the Grand Canyon, and it has the potential of destroying the whole thing. Join us as we uncover what's truly going on in the canyon, and how it might just close down the canyon for good. The name Grand Canyon is befitting because of its immense size and literal grandeur. The canyon is almost 300 miles in length, reaches widths of up to 18 miles, and boasts an average depth of about one mile. Its sheer scale is breathtaking, but something like this doesn't just pop up. A lot goes into it to get to this point. The formation of the Grand Canyon is a complex geological process that has unfolded over millions of years. It involves the combined forces of the Colorado River, uplift events, and the erosive power of water. The primary agent responsible for carving the Grand Canyon is the Colorado River. As the river flowed across the Colorado Plateau, it began cutting into the layers of sedimentary rock that were deposited over millions of years. The river's continuous flow and the abrasive action of sediment and debris carried by the water gradually wore away the rock, deepening and widening the canyon. The deposition of the rock layers in the Grand Canyon began not millions, but billions of years ago. These layers consist of different types of sedimentary rocks, which are formed from the accumulation and compaction of sediments like sand, mud, and organic material. The sediments were deposited in various environments, such as ancient seas, deserts, and river floodplains, creating distinct layers that are visible today. Over time, tectonic forces caused the Colorado Plateau to rise, lifting the region to much higher elevations than they were at before. But you see, this uplift wasn't really uniform, and different parts of the plateau were raised at different rates. As the plateau rose, the Colorado River and its tributaries started downcutting into the rock layers, forming deep canyons. The process of downcutting occurs as the river flows across the land, carving its way through the layers of rock over time. As the water moves downstream, it carries sediment and debris which act as tools of erosion. The force of the water, combined with the abrasive action of sediment, gradually wears away the rock, cutting deeper into the landscape. The rock layers that make up the plateau vary in their resistance to erosion. Some layers are more durable and resistant, while others are softer and more easily eroded. As the river encounters different types of rock, it may erode the softer layers more quickly, creating step-like formations known as terraces. Over time, these terraces can further contribute to the deepening of the canyons. The downcutting process is not uniform, but occurs at different rates along the course of the river. Factors such as the geologic composition of the rocks, the slope of the terrain, and variations in the river's flow contribute to the varying rates of erosion and the creation of the intricate canyon landscape. The result of this continuous downcutting process is the formation of deep canyons with towering cliffs, intricate rock formations, and breathtaking vistas. While the Colorado River's erosive power might have been powerful enough to get most of the work done on its own, but was actually helped by other processes, such as weathering and mass wasting. Weathering refers to the breakdown of rocks into smaller particles, while mass wasting involves the movement of these particles downhill due to gravity. So while erosion was happening all around the area, these processes gave it all an added push, especially along the walls of the canyon. You see, human history in the Grand Canyon region dates back over 12,000 years. The earliest evidence of human presence in the area goes back more than 10,000 years, with archaeological finds indicating the existence of ancient hunter-gatherer societies. These early inhabitants lived in the region, 
utilizing its resources and adapting to its unique environment. In the 16th century, European explorers, including the Spanish, ventured into the area. Around 1540, a group led by the Spanish conquistador Francisco Vázquez de Coronado is believed to have been the first European expedition to encounter the Grand Canyon. This is believed that this expedition was the first European encounter with the Grand Canyon. However, the Spanish explorers and subsequent European settlers faced numerous challenges when attempting to establish permanent settlements in the region. The rugged and inhospitable terrain, extreme temperatures, and scarcity of resources posed significant difficulties for sustaining life and building communities. On top of that, the indigenous Native American tribes who had a long-standing presence in the area weren't really that receptive to European colonization efforts. The lack of viable resources, including water, fertile land for agriculture, and accessible transportation routes, made it impractical for European settlers to establish lasting settlements in the Grand Canyon region. So, the European explorers moved on to other areas in search of more suitable conditions for colonization and resource extraction, which made a lot more sense for them at the time. But, while European settlers didn't establish permanent settlements in the Grand Canyon region, their encounters and explorations still contributed to expanding knowledge of the area among European nations and furthered the understanding of the geological and cultural significance of the region. But Native American tribes have a deep-rooted connection to the Grand Canyon. Among the ancient tribes that inhabited the Grand Canyon area were the ancestral Puebloans, also known as the Anasazi. They were skilled farmers, building intricate cliff dwellings and pueblos within the canyon walls. The canyon basically served as their home and provided protection from the elements, Ancestral Puebloans had a sophisticated understanding of agriculture and water management, utilizing terraced fields and irrigation systems to cultivate crops in arid environments. Another ancient tribe that occupied the Grand Canyon region was the Cojonina. They were skilled hunters and gatherers, relying on the diverse resources available in the area for their sustenance. The Cojonina are known for their rock art, leaving behind intricate petroglyphs and pictographs that can still be found in the canyon today. These artworks provide a glimpse into their cultural practices and beliefs. The Paiute people, another ancient tribe in the region, were nomadic hunter-gatherers who traversed the canyon and surrounding areas. They had a rich oral tradition, passing down stories and legends that celebrated the land's spiritual significance. While these ancient tribes gradually moved away from the immediate canyon area, their connection to the land remained strong. They continued to visit the Grand Canyon for spiritual ceremonies and cultural practices and to maintain a sense of ancestral ties. The canyon was, and still is considered, a sacred place of great significance, woven into their cultural fabric and identity. But it's possible that you've heard nothing about these tribes until now, and that's because, over time, they've evolved. Many modern-day Native American tribes in the area today trace their ancestry back to these ancient civilizations. Tribes such as the Havasupai, Navajo, Hopi, and Hualapai have strong cultural, historical, and spiritual connections to the Grand Canyon. These tribes consider the canyon a sacred place and continue to perform ceremonies and traditional practices and hold cultural events within its boundaries, and are one of the only people to have access to some parts of the canyon. The exploration and understanding of the Grand Canyon gained momentum more so in the 19th century. John Wesley Powell, born in 1834, was an American geologist, ethnologist, and explorer with a deep fascination for the natural world. Powell's interest in the Grand Canyon and the Colorado River led him to embark on a series of expeditions in the late 1800s that would contribute greatly to the understanding of the region's geological and ecological features. His most renowned expedition, known as the Powell Geographic Expedition, took place in 1869. Along with a team of nine men, Powell set out to explore the largely uncharted Colorado River and its course through the Grand Canyon. The expedition's primary objective was to conduct scientific research and document the geological formations, flora, fauna, and indigenous cultures encountered along the way. 
While it sounds like fun, and in a way, was too, the journey was difficult and filled with challenges. Powell and his team faced treacherous rapids and had to deal with having limited supplies, while also making their way through the constant threat of danger as they navigated the uncharted waters. Despite these bumps in the road, Powell meticulously documented the canyon's geology, making detailed observations of the rock layers, their composition, and the evidence of past geological processes that shaped the landscape. Powell's expeditions provided valuable scientific insights into the geological history of the Grand Canyon. His observations and research helped establish the concept of geological time and the understanding that the canyon's formation was the result of millions of years of erosion by the Colorado River. He recognized the immense scale and complexity of the canyon's geological features, noting the distinct rock layers and the evidence of ancient marine environments. But that's not all. Powell's expeditions also shed light on the ecological diversity of the Grand Canyon. He actually documented numerous plant and animal species, identifying unique adaptations to the harsh desert environment. Because normally, when we think about a landscape like the Grand Canyon, there's not a lot of wildlife that comes to mind. But in reality, he found lots of different types of wildlife that were thriving in the area. Powell didn't just leave it at that, though. He also documented the cultural practices and artifacts of Native American tribes encountered during the expeditions. His expeditions and subsequent publications, including his book, The Exploration of the Colorado River and Its Canyons, published in 1875, brought a lot of attention to the Grand Canyon and its scientific importance. His work played a crucial role in establishing the Grand Canyon as a site of scientific significance and fueling public interest in its exploration and preservation. And everyone got involved. U.S. presidents, government workers, and international bodies like the United Nations, everyone had a part in making sure that the Grand Canyon stays as safe as possible. One significant milestone in the protection of the Grand Canyon happened during the presidency of Benjamin Harrison. In 1893, President Harrison designated the canyon as the Grand Canyon Forest Reserve, recognizing the need to safeguard its natural resources. The aim here was to preserve the canyon's forests, wildlife, and watersheds from potential exploitation and unregulated development. Over the following decades, efforts to protect the Grand Canyon really gained momentum. In 1908, President Theodore Roosevelt, who was a passionate advocate for preserving America's natural landscapes, declared the Grand Canyon a national monument under the Antiquities Act. This designation aimed to safeguard the canyon's scientific, scenic, and historic features. But it was not until 1919 that the Grand Canyon achieved its highest level of protection. On February 26, 1919, the Grand Canyon was officially established as a national park by an act of Congress and signed into law by President Woodrow Wilson. Now, on one hand, it does make sense because the park is so unique and has so many years of history behind it. But on the other, it makes one wonder, what's really going on under all that rock that's so important that the park needs this much protection? It's clear that this isn't just an average park. There's got to be something extremely special going on there. And well, throughout history, lots of different stories have come up and have subsequently been silenced, making the question pop up even more. One of the most popular ones here is the discovery of an underground civilization in the Grand Canyon. At first, you might just think that this has to do something with the ancient tribes we talked about early on in the video, but that's not the case. This civilization goes back much further. In 1909, an interesting story emerged in the pages of the Phoenix Gazette, capturing the imagination of readers and igniting a fascination with the unknown depths of the Grand Canyon. The newspaper published two totally separate articles detailing the alleged discovery of a vast underground citadel hidden within a cave system, believed to have been the home of an ancient race of oriental origin, potentially from Egypt. This was huge. The explorer behind this remarkable find was G.E. Kincaid, who claimed to have embarked on an expedition that took him deep into the mysterious depths of the canyon. According to the accounts published in the Phoenix Gazette, Kincaid's exploration took place prior to the closure of the sensitive areas, 
allowing him access to areas that were later off-limits to the public. Around 40 miles upstream from the El Tovar Crystal Canyon, Kincaid made a remarkable discovery. He noticed strange stains in the sediment formations, approximately 2,000 feet above him. Intrigued by what he was seeing, he anchored his boat, disembarked, and then went on a short hike to investigate the source of these marks. As Kincaid walked further into the landscape, he stumbled upon something extraordinary hidden beneath a covering of desert brush. Steps. Carved meticulously into the sandstone, these steps wound their way upwards, eventually leading Kincaid to a high shelf on the side of the canyon. This man was a true explorer, so it's no surprise that he didn't think twice before following the path. He just kept going, and with that, he made a startling discovery, an entrance to a cave. It was clear that this cave wasn't just a natural formation. Someone actually built it. It seemed to be the gateway to a hidden underground realm, a citadel concealed from the world for at least a millennia, which was a discovery that he just wasn't expecting to make that day. One look up at the walls, and he realized that they weren't empty. Hieroglyphics covered them. At this point, it was clear that he had stumbled upon something crazy and had to go in and find out more. The main passageway, which Kincaid went through, measured approximately 12 feet wide, leading to lots of different rooms of varying sizes. Some chambers stretched as large as 30 by 40 square feet. It was clear that a lot of careful planning had gone into creating this underground city. Kincaid especially noted the city's impressive construction, with thick walls and intricate features. Within the city, Kincaid discovered granaries, cooking areas, and a large dining hall. He also found artifacts, including copper tools that seemed technologically advanced for the region. In one room, he came across a crypt filled with mummies, which just proved that this city wasn't just old, it had ancient Egyptian roots. That's because all of the other tribes that had ever existed in the region were either from Europe or Native Americans, neither of which mummify their dead. Realizing the significance of his discovery, Kincaid sought support from the Smithsonian Institution. They sent a team led by Professor S.A. Jordan to aid in the excavation, so the work started to go on a lot faster. And with that, they made some serious discoveries. First up was the sandstone, which Joe Rogan has also talked about on his podcast. You see, sandstone is a very specific building material, and it's the same one that's used in the building of the Egyptian pyramids. It's a major possibility that this civilization existed at the same time that the pyramids were being built, halfway across the world in Egypt. The scientists also found a symmetrical layout in the cave system, with a central chamber containing a Buddha-like statue. The cross hall, a vast room, housed rows of mummies at different levels. At first, the mummies were excavated, but after a few months, the Smithsonian claimed that they didn't know anything about the site at all and that there were no mummies ever recovered. But this wasn't going to sit well with the people that were working on the site, so they started asking questions. That, however, would end up being the mistake that potentially cost them their lives. Kincaid and Jordan mysteriously vanished, along with almost everyone that had ever been employed at the site. But that wasn't all. The government restricted access to the area, citing that the walls of the caves weren't very strong and could end up falling. When any areas of the canyon are considered too unpredictable or dangerous, they can easily be closed off to the general public. And that's exactly what happened. Leaving the Citadel's secrets hidden in the depths of the Grand Canyon. Eventually, it went from being hidden to lost, because the Smithsonian just labeled everything a hoax and separated themselves from the entire story leading to this discovery being lost to time. But that's where things get even more interesting, because that's not the only time that happened in the Grand Canyon. There's also the Great Unconformity. The Great Unconformity holds a special place in the study of the Grand Canyon, standing as a geological feature of immense significance. This remarkable phenomenon represents a gap in the rock record, stretching across an extensive time span between the Cambrian period, approximately 550 million years ago, and the pre-Cambrian era that precedes it. This is an astonishing range of time, 
estimated to span from 250 to 1, 200 million years within the walls of the Grand Canyon's geological history. Geologists have determined its age by comparing the ages of the rock layers above and below the gap. This strange feature is particularly notable for three primary reasons that shed light on the canyon's geological evolution. Firstly, it signifies a long period of time that is missing from the rock layers. Geologists determine its age by comparing the ages of the rock layers above and below the gap, which is something that's never really been done anywhere else, so to say that it is extremely special would be an understatement. Secondly, the Great Unconformity is important because it's a distinct surface in the rock record. It separates the horizontally layered tapete sandstone and overlying Paleozoic rocks from the tilted and faulted sedimentary rocks of the Grand Canyon supergroup. This boundary highlights a significant shift in the geological history of the area. It reveals that everything isn't as seamless as it seems on the surface and that multiple layers go into it to make it what it is. The Great Unconformity also serves as a regional unconformity. This means that it represents a significant boundary between different rock formations in the area. Above the unconformity, the Tonto group and subsequent rock layers are relatively horizontal and undisturbed. In contrast, the rocks below the unconformity, including the Grand Canyon supergroup and Vishnu basement rocks, have experienced significant tectonic forces and deformation over time, resulting in their tilting and faulting. This boundary holds geological significance because it represents a major shift in the history of the Grand Canyon region. The rocks above and below the Great Unconformity have undergone different processes and geological events, indicating distinct periods of Earth's history. Understanding this division and the forces that shaped the rocks can provide valuable insights into the geological evolution of the area and the processes that have influenced its formation over millions of years. Scientists have put forth different ideas about what might have caused the Great Unconformity. Some believe that it could be connected to a period called Snowball Earth. Others suggest that the movement of Earth's tectonic plates during the breakup of the supercontinent Pangaea might have played a role. Snowball Earth refers to a time in Earth's history, approximately 650 to 700 million years ago, when the planet experienced severe global glaciations. During this period, the entire Earth was covered in ice, from the poles to the equator. The extreme glaciations of Snowball Earth had a serious impact on the planet's geology and climate. Massive ice sheets covered the area, causing significant erosion as they advanced and retreated, scraping away surface rocks and eradicating any evidence of previous geological events. This erosion could account for the absence of rock layers during the Great Unconformity. The mechanisms behind Snowball Earth events are still not fully understood, but they are believed to involve a combination of factors such as changes in Earth's orbit, atmospheric composition, and the feedback effects of ice cover. The intense glaciations during Snowball Earth may have played a role in erasing geological records, including the missing layers seen in the Great Unconformity. But another proposed explanation for the Great Unconformity is related to the breakup of the supercontinent Pangaea. Around 200 million years ago, Pangaea began to rift apart, leading to the formation of separate continents as we know them today. This tectonic activity involved the movement of Earth's crustal plates, which caused significant changes to the Earth's surface and its geological record. During the breakup of Pangaea, massive rift zones and associated faulting occurred, causing the rocks to fracture and tilt. These tectonic forces may have played a role in the erosion and removal of the rock layers that should have been present in the Great Unconformity. The intense geological activity associated with the continental breakup could have reshaped the landscape and erased significant portions of the rock record, leading to the observed gap. Understanding the precise role of these processes in causing the Great Unconformity is challenging. The Earth's geological history spans billions of years, and deciphering events that occurred so long ago is inherently difficult. Scientists use various methods, including studying rock formations, fossils, and geochemical analyses, to piece together the puzzle and generate hypotheses about the causes of the Great Unconformity. 
But the explanations we've just talked about are not mutually exclusive, and the truth may involve a combination of factors. The Earth is so unique that there may be hundreds of little things happening at all times that come together to do something that's unbelievable. Like the fact that beneath the beauty of the Grand Canyon lies a hidden secret that adds an element of danger to this natural wonder. A volcanic field known as the Uinkaret Volcanic Field. This volcanic field is located on the northern rim of the Grand Canyon in northwestern Arizona. This area is full of cinder cones, which are small volcanic cones formed from ejected fragments of lava and volcanic ash. Over time, the eruptions from these cinder cones have resulted in the creation of lava flows that have flowed down into the depths of the Grand Canyon itself. The molten lava, pouring from the cinder cones, descended the canyon walls and interacted with the rugged landscape, leaving behind evidence of its powerful presence. During these volcanic episodes, the lava flowing, even if it was just occasionally acted as natural barriers within the canyon, temporarily obstructing the path of the Colorado River, causing water to accumulate and form temporary lakes or ponds. This interruption in the river's flow would have had a significant impact on the surrounding environment, altering the natural course of the water and shaping the geological features of the canyon. Despite its current state of dormancy, the Winkaret volcanic field beneath the Grand Canyon is regarded as a potentially hazardous volcanic area. Although there is no ongoing volcanic activity, the field needs to be continuously monitored and researched to make sure that potential risks associated with the region stay just at the potential level. If the Uinkaret volcanic field were to become active, it could pose a major threat to the entire Grand Canyon. If the volcanic activity got to the point that it resulted in lava flows, they could potentially reach the main canyons. The lava would slowly advance and spread across the landscape, altering the existing topography and potentially filling in certain areas of the canyon. Even though the scale and extent of this impact would depend on the magnitude and duration of the eruption, but even a small amount might end up causing irreversible damage to the topography of the entire place. Not only that, but eruptions often release volcanic ash into the atmosphere, which can be carried by winds and deposited over a wide area. If the Winkaret volcanic field became active again, the surrounding region, including parts of the Grand Canyon, might experience ashfall. This could potentially destroy the air quality, vegetation, and wildlife in the affected areas, even if they're not in the immediate vicinity of the volcano itself. Not only that, but in certain types of volcanic eruptions, pyroclastic flows can take over. These are fast-moving, high-temperature currents of gas, ash, and volcanic debris that can travel down the slopes at high speeds. If pyroclastic flows were generated during an eruption in the Uinkaret volcanic field, they could pose a significant danger to nearby areas, potentially impacting parts of the Grand Canyon and melting them away. Plus, let's not forget about the fact that volcanoes emit various gases, including sulfur dioxide and carbon dioxide, during eruptions. These gases can have environmental and health impacts, such as causing respiratory problems, acidifying water bodies, and affecting vegetation. The release of volcanic gases could affect the air quality and ecosystems in the vicinity, including parts of the Grand Canyon. But that's just the tip of the iceberg here. The arid climate and vegetation in and around the Grand Canyon create conditions favorable for wildfires. Lightning strikes or human activities can ignite fires that spread rapidly, posing risks to both natural resources and nearby communities. Wildfires can cause evacuation orders, temporary closures of hiking trails, and reduced air quality due to smoke. Fire management agencies actively monitor and respond to these incidents to minimize their impact. But considering how massive the area is, it's very easy for things to get out of hand fast. Plus, there's the fact that the rugged terrain of the Grand Canyon is susceptible to landslides and rockfalls, especially in areas with steep cliffs and unstable rock formations. Landslides and rockfalls can endanger hikers, damage infrastructure, and block roadways. And the worst part is that all of it can happen within minutes, leaving the people in the area pretty much no time to deal with it all. When you think about all of this in a general sense, it might seem like if any of this were to happen, 
It would be an isolated few incidents that wouldn't really harm the Grand Canyon as a whole. And in a way, that could be true. Unless there was something that could potentially unify all of these threats, something like earthquakes. There are numerous faults traversing the Grand Canyon area, and historical records indicate the occurrence of several earthquakes over the past century. During the 1900s, around 45 earthquakes were recorded within or near the Grand Canyon, highlighting the seismic activity present in the region. Among these, several earthquakes reached magnitudes ranging from 5.0 to 6.0 on the Richter scale, demonstrating the potential for significant movement. Although the majority of earthquakes in the Grand Canyon are relatively small, it is important to note that larger events have also taken place. One such occurrence was a 4.4 magnitude earthquake in Beaver Dam, Arizona, which is in close proximity to the Grand Canyon and ended up doing some damage to the area. A powerful earthquake can have an indirect influence on volcanic systems, including those near the iconic Grand Canyon. While the relationship between earthquakes and volcanic activity is complex and not fully understood, there are a few mechanisms through which seismic stress can potentially impact nearby volcanoes, even those in the vicinity of the Grand Canyon. One way seismic activity can affect volcanoes is through volcanic unrest. When an earthquake occurs, the seismic stress can cause changes in the stress distribution within the Earth's crust, potentially influencing the behavior of magma chambers and hydrothermal systems beneath nearby volcanoes, including those close to the Grand Canyon. The release of accumulated stress during an earthquake can induce changes in the pressure and fluid dynamics of volcanic systems, leading to increased seismicity, ground deformation, gas emissions, or changes in thermal activity. These signs indicate a state of heightened volcanic activity, which, if present near the Grand Canyon, would raise concerns about potential volcanic eruptions. Seismic waves generated by an earthquake can also reach nearby magma reservoirs, including those beneath volcanoes in the Grand Canyon, influencing magmatic processes. The pressure, temperature, and viscosity of the molten rock can be affected by the seismic waves, potentially triggering changes in magma ascent rates, gas bubble formation, and magma degassing. These alterations in magmatic processes can influence the overall behavior of a volcano, increasing the likelihood of massive eruptions. Earthquakes are often associated with the movement along faults, which are fractures in the Earth's crust. Faults can act as pathways for magma ascent, providing channels for volcanic activity. The stress redistribution caused by a large earthquake can affect the connectivity and permeability of fault systems, potentially promoting or hindering magma movement, even in volcanic regions close to the Grand Canyon. This, in turn, can impact volcanic activity in the surrounding area. If by any chance one of the major dormant volcanoes become active in the field, they might trigger the others in the area to also wake up. With that comes earthquakes and eruptions which could possibly destroy the entire Grand Canyon as a whole. With it, there's a possibility for another unconformity and possibly an eruption so massive that no one can enter the park anymore. While for now, things seem pretty calm, but considering the unbelievable things we've found in the Grand Canyon so far, it wouldn't be that surprising if the area goes from being super calm to totally unrecognizable. But will that really happen soon? Let us know what you think in the comments below. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up, and like always, we'll see you in the next one.